The lifespan of any new insecticide, herbicide, pesticide in general is probably in the neighborhood of five to seven years, generally. If it is widely adopted and widely used, that is it's sprayed intensively over large acreages, it will fail fairly quickly. And that's because if there is a huge infestation of insects, then there is probably a great deal of genetic variation out there, and those toxins are going to find mutations for resistance. The problem is that it takes somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 years to get new products on the market. <clears throat> now, the agrochemical industry knows that, and they've already got the next generation of chemicals. They're working on it, they're working on it. Um, it takes, however, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 plus million dollars to bring a, a product from the planning stage to the market uh, and as I say, in about eight to 10 years. So um, <clears throat> the problem is resistance. If I really wanna get down to, as we talked about earlier, uh, the ultimate reason things go extinct is that there is a, the ultimate reason that, uh, that chemicals fail to be effective for any length of time is this. The ultimate reason rather than the proximate reason is this. Chemicals are a technological tool, a non-living, non-adapting tool for dealing with a very specific problem. Unfortunately, that problem is embedded in a biological system. And the biological system will adapt to any stress. The technological tool is a stress. If we take a biological system such as a bug and we attempt to kill it with a technological tool such as a chemical, the bug will adapt to the chemical very quickly and the chemical is incapable of adapting in response. The chemical becomes ineffective and fails, the bug goes on living. And this is the ultimate reason why uh, we cannot win a war against living things using non-living tools. Not unless we want to maybe go to the extreme and just sort of like firebomb our fields and eliminate every living thing altogether. Uh, and unless we are willing to take that step, we will fail every single time we apply a technological tool to a biological system. It will adapt to that tool and then we'll be faced with coming up with a new tool. The answer to the question as to why we use by far the most chemicals in agriculture is because I think we are the center of the industrialization of agriculture. And so we are the, in, the center of the use of all technology for growing food. So we, we've led the charge. We're developing the latest breakthroughs, if you want to call them that. A number of other companies, countries that do a great deal of agriculture have just shied away from being that, that uh, intensively committed to using technology to grow food, um, in part because they can see the writing on the wall. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not hard to read that this is a pathway that leads absolutely nowhere. Um, in, with the concept of uh, the Red Queen, we are running and running as fast as we can. We're not getting anywhere, but if we want to be in this race, we have to run and we have to run as fast as we can. Now, one of the things about the modern agriculture is this, we are never leading this race. We're always, always running catch up. We're always trying to catch up because when we're being, when we have a problem with a crop pest, the, that, that pest exists already, the problem is already there, we now have to deal with it. We go into crisis mode to deal with it. <clears throat> we are never ahead of the game. And in fact, the way biology works, we can never be ahead of it. At, at best, we can sort of run even, and we're never going to get ahead. If we recognize that, then we recognize we have to get out of this chemical treadmill. But the United States so far has run just as fast as possible in the opposite direction. We are, we are dead set on winning a race that does not have a finish line. There is no winning this race. It's a race you run, but it's not a race you can win. It is absolutely a race you can lose though. If you don't run, you lose. So once we get on that chemical treadmill, we have no real alternative except to just keep running. 
unless we get out of it entirely. As we've gotten into greater and greater use of pesticides, we've created industries that will supply us with those pesticides. Um, and um, they are as responsive as, as any uh, company will be to the market. If the market wants more, they absolutely will provide it. They're going to charge us for it, no question about it, because their R&D costs are astronomical these days. And so they have to patent those products and they have to sell them at a premium. <clears throat> This is one of the real problems with uh, agrochemicals, and that is they are not medicines for the farm. With a medicine, um, we, we can take a new medicine that's got a patent, and it's going to cost us some money, but when the patent expires, anybody can make it, and it becomes a generic medicine, and now we can get it for very little cost. <clears throat> that's because we're not building up resistance, and, uh, and what we're treating is not building up a resistance to those those chemicals. When we use far, farm chemicals, we are immediately getting a pushback from the natural world, and the resistance builds very quickly, and then it isn't that we lose the patent on the product, we lose effectiveness of the product. So it doesn't do any good if it ever goes to a generic status. We don't have any use for it. Uh, one of the examples I've given is, um, is uh, flea medicine for dogs. I won't name any names, but when the first flea medicines came out, they had, they had chemical X in them. And after a while, chemical X didn't kill fleas anymore, and we know why that is, because fleas became resistant to chemical X. And so the next generation of flea medicine said, we're going to put two chemicals that kill fleas and now twice the power. Well, that's not exactly true, because the first one doesn't work anymore, and so really there's just one work, but now we're applying two chemicals to our dogs, knowing that one of them doesn't work. And then when that one doesn't work, they've now come out with, uh, there's one called Tritac, Triple Attack. Uh, it's got three chemicals, except two of them don't work. So uh, in the case of, of agricultural chemicals, we never get in the situation where we can use generic medicines. We, we can't even do what they're doing now in genetically modified crops where they're stacking different um, um, traits. Some of those don't work anymore. Um, and so we're stuck. Um, on this treadmill because we've bought into the idea that the next chemical will be better than the previous one and will somehow not behave like the previous one, but they all be, as far as the biological world is concerned, it's just another chemical. It's just another little obstacle that has to be overcome and there's nothing the biological world does better than overcome obstacles like stresses and insects and bacteria and tiny things like that are better at it than anybody. They can do it in a matter of weeks to months to a short number of years. So we, as a culture, the United States, have bought into a process that <laughs> is essentially a dead-end process, and we have so far been unwilling to give in to the the fact that um, this can't proceed indefinitely. There are other co countries that have the same problems we have. <clears throat> if, if you went to Uzbekistan, 90% of their economy is based on cotton. They have horrible problems with cotton. Everybody in the country works in cotton, on cotton, with cotton in some way. Um, in India and in China, they have gigantic problems with farms that use lots of pesticides. And in fact, they've discovered uh, <coughs> in some cases that when they're using genetically mod modified crops that are like, like Roundup Ready sorts of things that, are, that, uh, that are, can withstand the chemicals, within a couple of years, they're using even more chemicals than they were before. Um, the, the United States is just doing this on a bigger scale and, and on greater acreages for very specific things. So our use of chemicals uh, spans all crops, but it is particularly focused on cotton, which uses 25% of all the chemicals we use, but we only grow cotton on 5% of the land. Um, and then 
vast amounts on the soybeans, wheat, corn, canola, um, and other commodity crops that take up vast acreages in our country. Sad but true. Well, China and India are still largely based on rural economies. Um, they don't have highly mechanized um, <clears throat> commercial. They don't. They don't have commercial agriculture like we do. China has a government commercial agriculture, government sponsored. Uh, India, I don't think has. They probably do, but it's. But most of the countries are still rural and doing things in very traditional ways. They're slowly moving toward the American model, but but we went fast and in a big way. And we pushed out the small farmer. We did it, almost, no, I wouldn't say intentionally, but yeah. Uh, by subsidizing crops, particularly commodity crops, we pushed the small farmer right out of business. Yes, the, the words total production value are very important here because the very large farms are producing the commodity crops and small farms don't produce those crops. They, they probably quite often are focused on actual food. Um, commodity crops are not food. But if we look at total production, large farms produce by far the vast majority of the production in this country. Um, is it bad? Well, if you want corn, uh, I think that's the most efficient way to grow corn. It's the most destructive, the most damaging to the environment. Uh, but if you want, if that's your goal, then that's probably the way to do it. If your goal is to produce healthy food for your citizens, that is probably the opposite of the right way to do it. Um, the food production, things that we actually put in our mouths, is not grown in the Midwest. That food is grown in California, and it's grown in uh, particular areas that are suitable to those kinds of crops, and they are done on fairly large farms, but not in nearly anything that compares to commodity crop farming. So the question is difficult to answer. Um, the, our goal in, in, in having super large farms is to produce super large quantities of things that we don't really eat, but that's our farm production. It, it, you might argue that that's misplaced effort if your goal is to produce food, but it isn't misplaced effort if you're trying to produce fiber, for instance, that's cheap. I will also say, though, that um, very large farms um, take up almost all of the subsidies for, from the, farm, the U.S. Farm Bill. Uh, small farms get almost none. So they're, the that production is highly subsidized. In fact, corn prices are guaranteed. So if you're, if you're growing watermelons and you have no idea what the weather's going to be like and what the crop's going to be like, but you know that if you grow corn, you won't make as much money as a good watermelon year, but it's guaranteed, that's not a hard decision for a farmer. Um, you might, won't make as much money, but by golly, you can, you can plan for the future because you know what the budget's going to be, and you can't do that with, um, with food crops, cash crops. And by subsidizing the food for the animals, we are subsidizing the animals. And so, uh, you know, if, if the consumer wants low-cost food, this is how you get low, this is how you keep costs low. But I, I would also caution that if you use, uh, to get low cost food, we have a tendency to produce somewhat low quality food at the same time. So to keep food costs low, uh, something has to give there. Either the quality of that food goes down or you can't have as much of it. Um, and we want both. So I think the, the direction we're going is, subsidizing crops that keeps food prices down, but it also is now suppressing the quality of that food. And um, that's, the, that's the end result. And something that I'm very concerned about is, is this trade-off between quantity and quality. We have absolutely gone for quantity. And I think um, the loss that we are now experiencing and potentially suffering from is that we are eating low-quality food, and that's having uh, 
health effects on the human population.